This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. This is the city I was born in, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's a beautiful city of hills, bridges, and unique neighborhoods. But it's also been subject in recent decades to a notable phenomenon. Since 1950, with every passing decade, the city has had fewer residents than it had the decade before. Successful initiatives to clean the city's water and air, revitalize struggling neighborhoods, and bring in a high-wage tech industry have slowed this population decline significantly, but notably still has not led to any net growth. If the city were to double its population today, it would still have fewer people living within its city limits than it did in 1950. For four censuses from 1910 to 1940, the city was consistently among the 10 most populous in the country. Today, it ranks 68th. Much of this can be explained by a move to the suburbs. Looking at the entire urban area, it's still quite large at 30th in the country, but nonetheless, its urban area has grown at a rate much slower than that of other American cities. This declining, or looking at the whole urban area plateauing population, isn't unique to my hometown. Other cities, Cleveland, Buffalo, and Detroit, for example, have seen even sharper declines in population. If you look at the populations of their respective states, this decline is evident. In some cases, state populations do dip down. In most, it's represented by a noted slowing of growth. Look at population growth maps in just the last 10 years, and you can see regional trends. While Pennsylvania east of the Appalachians is growing, most of the state west of that first ridge of mountains is losing population. Over this same period of time, though, the country's population has grown, quite steadily and consistently. Other cities like Boston, New York, and Philadelphia have seen population drops as well during the suburbanization and white flight of the post-war era. Meanwhile, Sunbelt cities like Los Angeles, Miami, Dallas, and Phoenix saw only sharp and steady growth. The decline of the Rust Belt and the extent of population loss was absolutely an anomaly within the country. This slowing of growth, not just at the city but at the state level, means one thing. For the last few decades, people have been leaving. Though more people are being born in these states, and many are moving in as well, more have left than usual. They bring with them their regional dialects and accents, foods and cultures, memories of the places they came from, and hopes and visions for the places they're going. Often they leave for similar reasons and move to similar places as one another. The decline of the Rust Belt sparked a mass migration by every sense of the word. Millions of people leaving their cities and states to try their luck elsewhere. In many ways, it has been one of the defining American population events of the last half century. But it's a migration that's often overlooked, as it all happened within the boundaries of the same country. Where did they come from? Where are they going? How has America's history shaped the movements of its inhabitants? And what do people's decisions to leave one region for another tell us about the issues the country faces? These are the questions I'll ask in American Migration. It'll be a short series exploring mass migrations within the United States. It's a topic that's incredibly relevant, as some make the case that we are in the beginning of one right now. Hello and welcome to That Is Interesting. I'm your host, Carter. This is American Migration, Episode 1, The Rise and Fall of the Rust Belt, America's Industrial Powerhouse. This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, the best place to find and watch documentaries about science, history, technology, nature, travel, and so much more. CuriosityStream has exclusive award-winning films and shows that you can't watch anywhere else, plus the deepest collection of the best documentaries from around the world, deeper than any other streaming service out there. CuriosityStream adds new shows every week and is one of the very best deals in streaming. I actually personally used CuriosityStream well before this sponsorship. I'm a big fan of documentaries, that's why I enjoy making long-form content on YouTube. And if you enjoy this channel, I know you'll love the kind of films that are available on CuriosityStream. You can find high-quality documentaries on geography, culture, history, or any topics that interest you, such as science, technology, or music. And it's much more affordable than other streaming services. I'm currently enjoying a series they released called The U.S. East Coast. It takes you on an exciting journey up the Atlantic coast from Florida to Maine. If you enjoy my channel, I know you'll love this and any of the shows and films CuriosityStream has to offer. Even better, you can watch it on any of your devices, whether it's your laptop, TV, or mobile phone. 
Go to curiositystream.com slash TII or scan the QR code for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series. And for my fans, use promo code TII and you'll save 25% off. It's already one of the most affordable and best deals in streaming. So click the link below or go to curiositystream.com slash TII and save 25% right now. The Rust Belt is just a term. It's not defined by any set boundaries, nor does it encompass every part of America that has struggled to gain new residents throughout the last century. Places like Mississippi or North Dakota, which have grown far slower than the rest of the country on average, are rarely ever considered part of the Rust Belt. Nor was it a term that was always in use, only as the factories and mills, ports, rail yards, and refineries of the country's industrial core started to fall into disrepair and disuse, did rusting metal become a fixture of the landscape, a ubiquitous sign of larger problems. Generally though, it's thought to consist of a wide swath of land south of the Great Lakes, upstate New York, western and northeastern Pennsylvania, parts of West Virginia and Kentucky, most of Ohio, the northern parts of Illinois and Indiana, and the southern parts of Michigan and Wisconsin. Sometimes it's even extended to places like St. Louis, Baltimore, or South Jersey. But you'll always hear a few cities included. Buffalo, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Detroit, and smaller ones that don't get as much attention these days because their populations have fallen that steeply to the point that they're no longer considered major cities. Places like Youngstown, Scranton, and Gary. But to understand the population exodus out of the Rust Belt, we must first understand how its population came to be so large in the first place. At the turn of the century in 1900, each of the five most populous states in the country, New York, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Ohio, and Missouri were located at least partially within the Rust Belt, as were numbers 8 and 9, Indiana and Michigan, as well as six of the country's 10 largest cities. Back then, it was not the Rust Belt, but the Manufacturing Belt. Its dominance in the country lasted roughly a century, beginning around the mid-1800s, and it marked the first major shift in American population settlement since colonialism. The first time Americans had moved en masse away from the East Coast and turned the country's interior into a major center of population. Upon the country's independence, population was unsurprisingly concentrated along the Atlantic coast, in port cities that could trade with Europe and bring in new settlers, and in farms along the flat eastern seaboard. In 1790, at the first U.S. Census, the largest American cities were all port towns on or close to the coast. New York City, Philadelphia, Boston, Charleston, and Baltimore. And for the first few decades, as it had been for much of colonialism, the most populous state was Virginia, a mostly rural state that drew in large populations, both by choice but also by force, to work tobacco farms throughout the state. The Appalachians proved a daunting natural barrier. Though not high enough that they couldn't be crossed, the peaks, hills, and plateaus were difficult to settle and farm. The land on the other side had only been firmly in British hands for less than 15 years, and Britain had banned settlement across the mountains to avoid war with the native people who lived there. Though the U.S. upon independence technically stretched all the way to the Mississippi River, most of that land would only wind up in control of the U.S. government after a series of violent wars, displacements, and unfair treaties that pushed the native people out and further west. As this happened, settlers from the east moved in. For those living in poverty with little to their name, the land west of the Appalachians was promising. The coast was getting crowded, and large plantation owners owned most of the land, whereas for those who moved west, one could potentially own land and build a farm to feed themselves and their families. There were four main routes west. You could take a ship to the colonial French port city of New Orleans, and from there head up the Mississippi, or travel by foot, taking mainly three overland routes through low points in the mountains. The most famous is the Wilderness Road, popularized by Daniel Boone, which took hundreds of thousands of people from the east coast westward, starting at Roanoke at the foot of the Appalachians, following a series of valleys inland, and finally crossing through a tight mountain pass called the Cumberland Gap into Kentucky. Mass migrations west via the Wilderness Road began almost as soon as the country gained its independence, and Kentucky, along with neighboring Tennessee, became among the country's most populous states within just a few decades of statehood. Further north, though, were routes that would prove even more essential to the growth of the region. Perhaps the widest gap through the mountains was the Mohawk Valley in New York, 
sitting between the Appalachians and the Adirondacks, it followed the Hudson's main tributary west from Albany to the flat glacial plain south of Lake Ontario. A route called the Mohawk Trail passed through it, and from it, settlers from New York and New England could settle in the flat plains around Lake Ontario and upstate New York, or continue along the Great Lakes southwest. Though a more topographically difficult path than the Mohawk Trail, Braddock's Road was by far the shortest route west. Traveling up the Potomac to Cumberland, Maryland, settlers crossed the mountains to Pittsburgh, what was then a small town at the headwaters of the Ohio River. It provided another huge advantage. In Pittsburgh, settlers were practically as close as the watershed of the Mississippi River reached to the east coast. From there, they could take steamships down the river, providing faster access to land out west. In states like Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, accents, ancestry, and culture have been impacted by these different routes, which brought people from different cities and countries. The southern parts of the states have significant influence from Scots-Irish Southerners who took the Wilderness Road and came north from Kentucky. The central parts are more influenced by Germans who came from Pennsylvania, and the north by settlers of English ancestry from New England. While the Cumberland Gap was a popular early route west for settlers, the pathways of industry would not follow the long, winding mountain road, while the two northern routes offered much more significant geographic advantages for industrialization. The interior of the country proved chock full of resources for industrialization, coal, iron, limestone, and timber, and the flat, fertile soil south and west of the Great Lakes was easy to settle and especially promising to farm, meaning agricultural exports from the region could be huge. Plus, the existence of the lakes themselves was an enormous advantage. Ships could transport all these goods in much larger quantities than they ever could by road, and could do so over an enormous distance. But the lakes also had a major problem, a thundering, beautiful, spectacular problem called Niagara Falls. On top of that, past Lake Ontario, much of the St. Lawrence River was in the hands of Britain, a very recent enemy and a major regional rival, and the river's mouth was far from the port cities of the east coast. This meant that Lake Erie was about as far east as goods could reasonably be brought on the river. New York solved that problem with the construction of the Erie Canal, which followed the path of the Mohawk Trail, linking the Mohawk and from there the Hudson River to the eastern tip of Lake Erie. A town developed at the mouth of the canal called Buffalo, and from there shipments of grain and raw materials from around the Great Lakes could reach the Atlantic and the rest of the world by boat through the port of New York. The canal turned New York City into the country's most prominent port city and the need to ensure shipments saw it become America's indisputable financial center, solidifying its status as the country's largest city and main port of entry for immigration, and would additionally begin the steady transformation of Buffalo into an industrial powerhouse. Along the canal, cities like Rochester, Syracuse, and Utica grew as stops where raw materials would be unloaded, processed in mills and factories, and shipped down the canal to New York City. The general path of Braddock's Road, though, was still the fastest way for people to move west. The Maryland city of Cumberland was the jumping off point for the National Road, a route west that passed through what is now West Virginia, Ohio, and Indiana, all the way to central Illinois, and steamships took settlers downriver to fast-growing cities like Louisville and Cincinnati, the latter of which quickly became one of the largest in the country. Meanwhile, rail lines first crossed the mountains with the Baltimore and Ohio, or B&O, Railroad, a Maryland rail company which first reached the Ohio in the now West Virginia city of Parkersburg, and would soon connect from Baltimore and other eastern cities like Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., and New York, to cities on the other side of the mountains like Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Cincinnati, and St. Louis, which near the mouth of the Missouri River provided access even further west. New York and Pennsylvania would both surpass Virginia in population by just 1820, and hot on its coattails was Ohio, the country's third most populous state, by just 1850. Settlers kept going west in the flat, agriculturally productive states of Indiana and Illinois, both of which, like Ohio, sat on the two major land routes west as well as the water routes of the Great Lakes and Ohio River quickly followed. Just one decade later, they would round out the top five states by population. The Civil War forced the country to ramp up manufacturing, and it continued to boom long after the war's end. Besides being well-suited geographically for trade and transportation, the region sat atop a rich deposit of natural resources. Coal lay between much of Indiana and Illinois, as well as in the Appalachians from Alabama to western Pennsylvania, 
The first oil in the country was found in western Pennsylvania, and iron deposits were primarily around Lake Superior in northern Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Additionally, farmland was everywhere from Ohio westward. Goods, be they industrial or agricultural, were shipped east by boat along the Great Lakes and Ohio River. A few points proved particularly strategic. A small tributary of Lake Michigan called the Chicago River was just a few miles from the Des Plaines, a river whose water eventually flowed into the Mississippi and the closest point goods could get between the watersheds without having to leave a ship. The city of Chicago grew around the river as a portage, a site where goods would be unloaded and moved to the other river, and prospered even more as a canal was built connecting the two. Nearby Gary, Indiana proved an excellent place to mill steel. Sitting at the southern tip of Lake Michigan, shipments of iron could be brought far south down the lakes, while coal and limestone, the other two main ingredients, were found throughout the south of the state. In Michigan, Detroit sat on the only waterway connecting Lake Huron and from it Lakes Michigan and Superior to Lake Erie, and as such, all ship traffic would pass through it. As goods moved east, the best place to leave the Ohio River and cross the Appalachians was the city where the river began, Pittsburgh. And from the Great Lakes, it was the Ohio city of Cleveland, especially as a canal was built connecting it to the Ohio River. Ships could also keep going along Lake Erie and take the canal to New York City through Buffalo. Railroads went where the port cities were, and cities like Cincinnati, Milwaukee, and especially Chicago became major rail hubs and centers of grain exporting and livestock processing. Chicago and Cincinnati, home to major industrial stockyards and slaughterhouses. The spike in American industrialization happened at the same time as a series of wars, famines, and revolutions struck Europe. Now, with steamships offering cheap travel across the Atlantic and industrial jobs readily available, European immigrants crossed into the U.S. by the millions, coming from places like Ireland, Germany, England, and Scandinavia, arriving in processing centers like New York City's Ellis Island, from where many would take trains further west, moving into the fast-growing industrial manufacturing belt. Especially important to American manufacturing were Eastern European immigrants, and most of these states and cities have large populations of people descended from Polish and other Eastern European immigrants. A Scottish immigrant, Andrew Carnegie, was an early adopter of the Bessemer process, which made steel manufacturing significantly cheaper and easier, and turned his Carnegie Steel Company into an industrial giant that would merge with other steel companies to become U.S. Steel. He turned his adoptive city of Pittsburgh into America's steel city, helped by its location atop rich coal deposits and strategic location at the eastern edge of the waterways of the country's interior. Many other cities became specialized for specific industries as well. Furniture in Utica, salt in Syracuse, steel in Youngstown, flour milling in Rochester, glass in Toledo, pork in Cincinnati, iron and oil in Cleveland, brewing in Milwaukee, and of course auto manufacturing in Detroit, spurred by the success of Henry Ford's Ford Motor Company. As the country expanded west, its rail lines stretched from these industrial cities, where the coal that powered them was shipped in from. The skyscrapers that rose up in New York and along the east coast were built of steel manufactured in these cities, and as America became a rising economic power, much of its newfound wealth came from products created in this manufacturing belt. Cities in the region grew rapidly, and wealthy so-called robber barons often funded expensive public works projects, institutions that often still exist today, such as the Carnegie Library System. The Gilded Age, as it was known, wasn't always a great time to be alive. For most people, it was far from it. Wages were low, industrial working conditions were often quite hazardous, and pollution was widespread. In Pittsburgh, businessmen would have to change their white shirts at lunch, which had already turned black from soot. It soon took on an unflattering nickname, Hell with the Lid Off. In Cleveland, the moment when the Cuyahoga River caught fire famously inspired the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency and passage of the Clean Water Act. But this wasn't the first, second, or even third time the river had burned. The water was so polluted that it was able to catch fire on 13 separate occasions, dating all the way back to the very early years of industrialization in 1868. A strong tradition of organized labor developed, but was often cracked down upon with brutal force, and there were multiple deadly conflicts between police and labor protesters. The Haymarket Riots in Chicago, the Homestead Massacre near Pittsburgh, and the Bloody Coal Wars of West Virginia, which lasted for nearly a decade, to name a few. 
Mass immigration continued throughout the early 1900s, and the region benefited from another internal migration, which will probably be the subject of another video in this series, the Great Migration. In World War I and later World War II, many industrial workers from the Rust Belt enlisted, leaving manufacturing jobs in the region open. At the same time, the war itself necessitated even more industrial output. Black Southerners, many of whom labored as sharecroppers in the rural South, headed north, often to Rust Belt manufacturing and rail hubs, seeking better job opportunities and fleeing the racial segregation, discrimination, and poverty that was prevalent in the Jim Crow South. Around 6 million left over the course of several decades, and the Rust Belt was often a major destination. But World War II marked another turning point in the story of America's manufacturing core. The American and global economy were undergoing major shifts, and numerous changes over the second half of the 1900s would leave the region behind. There was no one factor precipitating this serious decline the region would see from around the middle of the century onward, and while people with political agendas will often focus on one element or another, in reality it was a complicated combination of factors that not only pushed people out of the Rust Belt, but pulled them to other parts of the country. I'll do my best to try to describe it in as much detail as I can, but it's obviously difficult to cover everything in a single video, so I apologize if I leave anything out. The simplest, most broad description though, is that following the end of the Second World War, the US underwent an economic transformation from a country dominated by mostly secondary sector industries to one dominated by mostly tertiary sector industries. The three sector model describes economies as primary, secondary, or tertiary. Primary industries are jobs in resource extraction, things like agriculture or mining. Secondary industries are areas like processing and manufacturing, turning raw materials into consumer goods, and the tertiary sector is what's often called the service industry, a broad category of jobs that aren't involved in either extraction or production, but rather providing a service to customers, anything from trucking to food service to banking, finance, or entertainment. Countries are generally considered to be more economically developed as they move into having a tertiary sector economy. By World War II, this transition was well underway, with the service sector overtaking the manufacturing sector for the first time. Just three decades later, a full two-thirds of American workers were employed in service industries. As workers left manufacturing jobs, it was the country's manufacturing core, the Rust Belt, that was most severely affected. A booming post-war economy and programs like the GI Bill gave many young veterans significant flexibility about where they wanted to live and work. Improvements in air conditioning meant that parts of the country with summers that were so hot that life there would be extremely difficult no longer saw temperatures as a serious obstacle. On top of that, the construction of a number of massive dams that provided water and electricity to the southwest meant that a large swath of the country that previously couldn't support a huge population suddenly had the resources to do so. And with weather most of the year very pleasant and hot summers made bearable with air conditioning, the warm climates of the south and west coast were suddenly a major draw. Developers rushed to build in this region, known as the Sun Belt, and promoters advertised exciting new communities. For young people with strong job prospects, the Sun Belt was a major draw, and Rust Belt states like Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Michigan began losing people to Sun Belt states like California, Texas, and Florida, a trend that would continue for decades to come. Not everyone changed jobs by choice. The decline of American manufacturing was as much, if not more so, a result of mass layoffs as it was people seeking new opportunities. In the 1950s, the U.S. constructed an interstate highway system, something that was in many ways extremely beneficial for the country and made travel much more accessible for larger sections of the population. But while the U.S. took this important step in modernizing its infrastructure, it went all in on highways to the extent that many of the rail lines and canals that had brought it to such economic prowess in the century prior started to become obsolete. Goods are still often shipped by cargo rail, but American passenger rail is significantly behind large parts of Europe and Asia, and most of the canals that had offered the Rust Belt its strategic trade and shipping advantages are now out of use. In 1959, the US and Canada completed the St. Lawrence Seaway, making the entire Great Lakes system navigable through a number of locks and canals, like the Welland Canal, which bypassed Niagara Falls and connected Lake Erie to Lake Ontario within Canada. American ports like Duluth still pump out raw materials, but now the St. Lawrence is a viable path to the sea, and Rust Belt waterways like the Erie Canal are less useful. 
In 1930, 75% of domestic trade in the U.S. was shipped by rail, giving a strong advantage to the rail hubs of the Rust Belt. But the advantage of the highway system brought about a major shift. Rail is now the means of only 28% of domestic trade. Most is transported by truck. The highway system is much more direct between cities and doesn't have the historic concentration in the Rust Belt that railways and canals do. So the Rust Belt no longer has the clear trade route advantage that it once did. On top of that, companies chose to move factories and plants out of the region. The Rust Belt has always had a strong tradition of organized labor. And labor unions had significant success in raising wages and improving working conditions in industries where work was often difficult and dangerous. At the same time, the U.S. began to take pollution and other threats to the environment much more seriously. And cities across the Rust Belt saw significant success in cleaning up their water and air, providing a more healthy environment to those who lived there. But in an effort to increase profits, a number of companies moved production out of the region, heading for other countries where there were more raw materials to extract and little worker or environmental protections to speak of. The push to attract a relocation of American companies was beneficial for the economies of a number of other countries, but severely hurt American workers, and additionally resulted often in very little economic gains for the workers of the countries they moved to, who were often paid very low wages. With few expenses, American companies could produce goods abroad and ship them back to customers in the U.S. while still turning a profit. An incredibly inefficient method that had often very negative impacts on American workers as well as those in the countries they'd moved to, but was quite profitable for these companies themselves, it is now commonplace. Today, Americans are quite familiar with the majority of their consumer products being manufactured overseas. This decline in American manufacturing occurred at the same time as a manufacturing boom in China. Steel in particular, one of the backbones of the Rust Belt, took off in China. The country produces more than half of all the world's steel and is one of the U.S.'s largest trading partners overall. It's surpassed in trade with the U.S. by only two other countries, Canada and Mexico. The North American Free Trade Agreement lasted for two and a half decades, opening a free trade zone between the U.S. and its northern and southern neighbors. But as a result, it incentivized companies to move manufacturing into Mexico, where production was cheaper. It's estimated that it alone was responsible for the loss of around 700,000 American jobs. Some companies never even left the country, but moved production to other states where taxes were lower and less union organization was prevalent, in order to make larger profit margins. Michigan still dominates the American auto industry, for example, but many factories have moved to the southern U.S. Detroit saw significant job loss in the auto industry while factories were opening not only abroad but across the south. Manufacturing never really declined, it just moved. Despite all of this, manufacturing output in the US has, over the course of the last half century, generally increased, at least in dollars. While China has surpassed it, it generally seems looking at the statistic that American manufacturing has been consistently strong. In that sense, it really has. But if you overlap it with a chart showing actual manufacturing jobs, you'll see an inverse trend. While manufacturing output and manufacturing job trends used to roughly follow one another, in recent decades manufacturing employment has plummeted dramatically, even while output increases. This is largely due to the rise of automation. With improvements in automation technology, many factories were able to produce goods using far fewer workers, an advancement in productivity that at the same time has had very real human costs. The Great Recession in 2008 further gutted already diminishing manufacturing employment numbers. 1.6 million people lost their jobs, a 35% decrease for the industry. And while they've recovered somewhat in recent years, they still haven't returned to pre-recession levels. While manufacturing did itself grow, it happened at a much slower pace than other industries as the American economy diversified. At the same time, while coal fields of states like Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Kentucky, Illinois, and Indiana once dominated the American coal industry, providing a strategic advantage to the Rust Belt, the American energy industry was changing, and not just with the rise of renewable energy. Appalachian coal reserves had been depleted significantly, as much of it has already been mined from the ground. At the same time, energy plants began moving from coal to natural gas, which was cheaper to produce. Hydraulic fracturing, better known as fracking, boomed in the early 2000s, and while Pennsylvania was a major center of fracking, it was also spread out into other states like Texas, Colorado, and North Dakota, 
but fracking employed far fewer people than coal mining ever did, and when the boom died down, many of those jobs disappeared. American coal mining itself shifted west to Wyoming. Huge reserves lay within the state's Powder River Basin. As technology improved, the rise of strip mining made Wyoming coal much easier to mine than Appalachian coal, a process that, like fracking, employs far fewer people and is mostly mechanized, and it became cheaper to ship this coal from the west to the east than it once was. Even if these industries hadn't moved out of the region, energy requires significantly fewer workers than it once did. The Rust Belt's job loss in energy has been, like its loss in manufacturing jobs, the result as much of technological changes that have cut workers out of the equation as the jobs moving themselves. Job loss led to a host of other issues, plunging the region and its respective cities into crisis. Cities experienced high unemployment. In the greater Pittsburgh area, for example, 18% of residents were unemployed in the 1980s. Job loss in core industries had a ripple effect. If former steel workers, for example, were out of money, they could no longer afford to shop at local businesses. Business owners in small towns and big cities alike saw significant impacts as huge portions of their consumer base were suddenly out of work and many to close up shop themselves. Looking for better opportunities, people moved and did so by the millions. From 1970 to 2010, for example, Western Pennsylvania saw a net out-migration of 400,000 people, not just the amount who left, but the number who left compared to the number who arrived. This population loss led to even more problems, exacerbating the issues local businesses had in staying afloat. Some towns were hit harder than others. It's commonplace to see malls closed and abandoned, but was once a major social and economic center, now a blight on the community, or see towns whose main streets are empty, with windows boarded up, doors marked that the building is to be condemned. The opioid crisis has struck the region with particularly devastating consequences. It all coincided with a move of many people to the suburbs across the country. And so while urban areas of large cities even grew in general, the cities themselves shrunk by huge proportions. Buildings went abandoned, and with a smaller tax and job base, cities were unable to maintain the infrastructure they'd built for a much larger population. Cities like Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Buffalo, and Detroit saw a major population loss, and have each lost at least 40% of their peak populations. The worst days for Detroit were much more recent. The Great Recession's impact on the auto industry saw a quarter of the city become unemployed, and in 2013 it infamously declared bankruptcy. Smaller cities whose economies have been even less diversified often took proportionally larger hits. One of the most drastically affected cities was Gary, Indiana. A steel and oil port in the southern tip of Lake Michigan, it was once the second largest city in the state, home to 180,000 people. Only a third of its population remains today, such a significant decrease that is often described as America's largest ghost city, though many people still call it home. It's a stark symbol of just how devastating the exodus out of the Rust Belt has been in some areas. Tall buildings and downtown high-rises sit abandoned, trees growing out of cracks and ledges, roads have fallen to disrepair, and many places have crumbled to the point where they're fully unpaved, even downtown. Churches and schools have been empty for decades, and those are just the buildings that are still there. More than anything, it's a city of vacant lots, fenced off, overgrown. Every year, more buildings come down, historic downtown blocks bulldozed. But it's not just Gary. Vacancy is an issue across the Rust Belt, from Toledo to Flint, Youngstown to Buffalo. There have been some silver linings. While much of the country faces high costs of living and housing prices, the Rust Belt is generally quite affordable. And in Detroit, where vacant lots are commonplace, locals have planted a number of urban forests and community gardens. The region's population decline has mostly been to the Sun Belt, which has grown rapidly in recent decades. From 1960 to 2020, the states of the Rust Belt generally did see growth, ranging from the 15% population growth of Pennsylvania to the 29% growth of Michigan, all the way to 46% in Indiana. Much of it, though, has been driven by a natural increase in the population, and has often been mostly concentrated in suburbs or non-Rust Belt urban areas within the state, like Indianapolis or Philadelphia. If you compare it to the country's population as a whole, which grew at 85% over that same time period, the region lags significantly behind. The Sun Belt, meanwhile, saw a massive boom. California took in the most people overall, gaining 23.8 million people, a 152% increase in population. 
the relative growth of states like Georgia, Texas, Florida, and Arizona were even higher, each taking in millions of people as well, with growth between 170 to 450 percent. The state with the most overall growth was Nevada, which experienced a remarkable population increase of 988 percent. Its largest city, Las Vegas, is the most populous city in the U.S. that was founded within the last century. It was an enormous shift, a mass migration that brought the country's centers of population from states like New York, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and Ohio to places like California, Texas, and Florida. States like Georgia and North Carolina have broken into the top 10, and should the growth of the Sun Belt and West Coast continue, states like Arizona, Washington, Tennessee, and Colorado may join them. But that's far from a foregone conclusion. Migration trends of the last half century appear to be changing significantly within the last few years, spurred by the pandemic and the rise of remote work. California, for example, is beginning to lose residents. Though just a drop in the bucket for such an enormous state, it could still end what's been a century and a half of incredible growth. Though often politicized, the greenhouse effect is very real, and a warming climate has hit the Sun Belt especially hard. A growing population puts a strain on limited water resources, and wildfires, hurricanes, and droughts are near yearly occurrences which continue to raise a cost of living that's boomed due to increased migration, while on the West Coast, housing shortages and high prices have led to a crisis of homelessness. Meanwhile, parts of the Rust Belt have begun to see real improvements. My hometown of Pittsburgh, for example, has managed to curb its population decline if not yet reach net growth, clean up a once heavily polluted city, and build a rising tech industry. Columbus, Ohio has thrived and is almost single-handedly driving the state's growth, and though it still deals with major issues, the often maligned Detroit has made very real improvements within the last few years. On top of that, some people theorize that the Rust Belt could be due for another in-migration. With abundant fresh water, a location far from the ocean, cooler temperatures, and limited natural disasters, some have argued that it's the best suited part of the country for a change in climate. On top of that, while an influx of new residents would strain many parts of the country, the cities of the Rust Belt already have infrastructure for a much larger population, and indeed are in need of new people. It's led some people to argue that the country's old manufacturing core is poised to someday once again sit in the driver's seat of America. I don't know what the future holds for the Rust Belt. Any prediction is little more than an educated guess, and extrapolating population trends out infinitely is a pretty pointless exercise. But I do know that my home region deserves better. The people who live there are kind, hardworking, and often care deeply about their communities. This region is an essential part of the country and its history, and its story is far from over. But the mass migration into and out of the Rust Belt is only one of several movements of humanity that have shaped the United States we know today. I'll cover all of the major ones in this series, American Migration. Up next, I'll be telling a story that goes hand in hand with this one, the sudden growth of the Sun Belt and its role in reshaping America. I'm also planning an episode on the great migration of black Americans out of the South to the cities of the North. If these are topics that you're interested in and are looking forward to, I think in the meantime you'll enjoy my video on America's ancestry, which chronicles the story of a few of the many different ethnic groups who arrived in the United States and the places they made home. My two-part regional breakdown of the US, which explores the vast regional, geographic, and cultural diversity of the enormous country, and my ongoing series, The US Explained, which takes a deep dive into every single state, territory, and federal district in the country, exploring the history, geography, culture, and society of each, and what makes every part of the country special and unique. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope you learned something new. Subscribe for more content like this. I cover the countries, cities, people, and places of the world and beyond. These videos will leave you saying, that is interesting.